want to welcome our viewers to Chautauqua People. This is a special edition done off season. Regular viewers of Chautauqua People will recognize our guest not in this view. This is Paul Rataco, who appeared on the program number 82 when he was dressed in a suit and in our studio. And I couldn't be happier. He's here to tell us about his, his work he's doing. I'm viewing him on a two screen uh, Zoom. He is in Poland and he's going to tell us a little bit about his work there with refugees from the Ukraine. Paul, if you remember, is a Georgetown prepared attorney and he uh, is, I guess I can say this, he's Polish and Italian descent. Mom grew up in Buffalo and he did an internship in Poland uh, along the way for his preparation. So he has some language skills and is he's appropriate person of our Chautauqua community to say, we need to reach out and help the refugees from Ukraine. So Paul, tell us a little bit what you're doing. All right. Well, thank you, John. Uh, unfortunately, my Polish is very bad, but uh, you know, I, I make a, uh, a, attempts every day to uh, to do what I can. Uh, when I was here before, it was communist times and nobody spoke English. Today, fortunately, many more people do speak English. So that's that's been helpful. But uh, so anyway, I've been uh, I've been here now for for three weeks. Uh, I flew in. I, I flew out basically on the 28th of February. I bought a ticket. I talked to my wife and talked about, you know, the skills and opportunities that I might be able to present and, and helping out uh, at the border. And she said, you're right, you have this, you should, you should think about going out and helping. So fortunately I had good family support and uh, my kids were on board. Uh, and so I, basically I bought a ticket the morning of the 28th and I flew out that night and uh, I got here on March 1st and I've been here pretty much uh, ever since. So uh, I am, uh, I am, uh, in a place called Helm, which is uh, which is about 25 kilometers from the border currently. I've been on the border in Dorohus, which is near Helm, and also in Zoshin. Zoshin is uh, the next border point down. So I've been, I've been, I came here with no formal organization. I came here because I thought I could help. Uh, and, and the way I came, uh, when I decided to come, uh, and let me just take a step back and just give you a little bit more background on why I decided to come. So not only did I study here during communist times, but additionally, when I was chief of staff uh, in, in Congress, the member of Congress that I worked for was the co-chair of the Ukrainian caucus and had one of the largest Ukrainian populations in the United States. So I just wanted, you know, I thought with that combination, with the network I had, I might be able to help. So I ended up coming over and lo and behold, a couple of former staffers for that member of Congress said, can we join you? And so two of them came, one brought his wife. And so our key was identifying what are going to be the needs down the road. While we had, were in Warsaw, while we were on the border doing that, I ran into coincidentally, some folks from the uh, World Central Kitchen and uh, was just chatting with them. It just so happens that Jose Andres, who founded World Central Kitchen, his daughters went to the same middle school as my kids. So I didn't come over here with them or anything. I had no relationship to them. Other, you know, one of his daughters babysat for our kids one time. That was about it. That was the only relationship I had. But uh, those folks called me up the next day and said, would you mind helping us in the north and, and some of the checkpoints and some of the internal reception areas, helping us, you know, set up those operations uh, so that we can transfer it to locals to sort of take over. And so that's what I've been doing for, for a number of weeks now. And, uh, and we're, we're sort of in that transferring process. We found a wonderful woman here who speaks English and Polish and uh, is very dynamic. And she's, she's sort of taking over, which is the whole goal. So I have been helping out, uh, you know, the uh, World Central Kitchen. Uh, we have identified sort of longer term needs. Uh, and so my, my friends and I, we've, uh, we have identified a, a U.S. nonprofit. We've, we seem like we're, we're pretty close to announcing probably, you know, in the next few days, uh, an arrangement where people can give a certain amount of money or pool money, and we'll be able to have longer term housing. So we're, we're working right now trying to finalize an agreement with Habitat Poland so that we can help as we raise money, we'll be able to help 
individual refugee families have longer term housing. So they'll be able to be, you know, six months or even possibly 12 months uh, in, in apartments around around Poland. So with that, I'll, 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 I'll pause and, and, and let you uh, ask any questions you may have, and any follow up. Paul, tell me about the uh, feeding program. What, what are you doing there in Poland, this organization? How many yeah, that's a great serving? question. Yeah, so World Central Kitchen is right now the only uh, group that is at every single border crossing providing hot food. And not only are, is the group at the border crossings, it is also at various reception centers. So when people come across, they oftentimes will take them to a reception center. In those centers, they may pair them up with people from other European countries who are, and they'll register everyone. So they are taking them to Austria or to Germany or to France or Sweden or what have you. Uh, additionally, there's so many people coming in. I mean, understand you're getting anywhere from, you know, 80,000 uh, to maybe 150,000 people a week uh, at, uh, or, you know, a day, sorry, a day coming across all these border checkpoints into Poland. So with that number of people, they've got sports gyms, you know, gyms, and they've got other, you know, abandoned warehouses that they've turned into uh, places for these folks to get food, to sleep. They have cots. There's one place, a Tesco, an old Tesco building in Helm here, where they have, uh, I think, seven or 800 beds for people. We are providing food there as well. So we've contracted. And what we typically do uh, is World Central Kitchen typically will contract with local chefs, restaurants, other providers to, to help provide that food. Where we have bigger need, we've built a, a, a kitchen down in Przemysl, which is near the main border crossing. And so they're generating separately from our partnerships, they're generating, I believe, 15,000 meals a day. What we're doing in the North is we've got kielbasa. We've got kielbasa that we've cooked. I, if I had to guess, we've probably, I mean, we've done tens of thousands of kielbasa in the last few weeks that we've been able to provide. So understand how cold it is. It is, it may only be 32 degrees some days. Today it's actually quite nice. It's 55 outside, but, but many of the days it's been 32 degrees and it is a biting cold. We are sort of on the plains and it just, it just hits you hard. What's happening overnight is it's getting down to 20 degrees and it's that biting cold. And for periodically throughout this entire refugee crisis, there have been people in Ukraine who've been standing in line in Ukraine at times for a day or two in this cold. So it's, it's pretty, pretty harsh conditions, especially at night. And so anything you can do to get people hot food, and remember these are mothers and children and grandmothers. So anything you can do to get them hot food, I think is, is, is really important. And, and how does the feeding operation work? Is it they sit down at a table or do you give them a, a plate or, or just, just what do you do? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, typically, I mean, with the kielbasa, we're, we're either delivering it up to the checkpoint. So we've got a grill sort of at the outside of the, the, the checkpoint area and, and people can come up and just get a, get a plate with kielbasa and bread and put condiments on it and, and go. Uh, or we'll oftentimes take, take a whole, you know, 50 or, or 100 of these up top and get it to people. Same thing, we're just serving it on a plate typically. Sometimes we'll do a container. That's what we're doing in other places. So in the Tesco, they've got hot meals that are in compartments, sort of like, you know, your hungry man dinners. Right. They prepare and they ship in hot because you've got a certain time frame. We were very, very strict on uh, making sure everything is sanitary and clean and uh, that time frames are not elapsed, you know, that you've got a certain amount of time that you can eat food. So we're very strict on that. So they bring that food in hot so the people who are staying at the Tesco can can get good hot food. We also have a pizza truck there so we can supplement with, with pizza uh, as well. At the train station in Helm, we've got a pizza truck and an, another place that's doing some, uh, some pork cutlet type, uh, type meal as well. So once again, just trying to go to those checkpoints where a lot of people are coming through, trying to give them, give them food. And typically what we try to do, if you're at our checkpoint at Dorhus, for example, we've set up a tent and it's got chairs and ultimately it's gonna have tables and heaters so that people can sit inside and, and eat food at a table. We have some tables there, we're, gonna, we're trying to expand that a little bit. Uh, and, and you'll see that if you go to different checkpoints, sometimes we've got tents, sometimes the local Polish humanitarian organization may have tents and sort of, it ends up that we, we sort of work with them 
uh, whether officially or unofficially, you know, you just, you're, everyone's here trying to do the same thing. We're trying to help a lot of people coming across the border at all times during the day. And understand this is 24 seven. So for example, this morning at Dorahus was, was actually quite quiet, but last night there were a lot of people coming through. So you just never know what's going to happen. There, there, it goes in waves, right? If you've got a tax on the road from Kiev, then it may slow you down two days from now. So we're always trying to get information about what the situation is, uh, anything we can get on, you know, that from, from public sources about, you know, where movements of people are and, and things like that. Now, the people coming across the border are desperately hungry. How long has it been since most of them have had a decent meal? You know, I don't know the answer to that. I think they're hungry and they're thirsty. They want something hot. I think they're, they're you know, uh, so for many of them. So, for example, I met a, an old man who was in a car and he had come from Kiev and he, uh, he had been in the car with his family for eight days. So I'm sure they had some food. It wasn't it wasn't super cold for them. They probably had to figure out a couple of days on how to get more gasoline for the car. But, uh, you know, uh, understand that whatever food they may have they've got to be hungry right because all they have is what's on their back right they, they left everything behind it is the scenes oftentimes are reminiscent of world war ii right you see those pictures of the people with their satchels you know and that's all they have in their bags i mean this is this is the same thing right i mean they they, they may not have a house to go back to an apartment to go back to because it may have been destroyed and so whatever they have in their bag that's it and so you know, it, you, you hear stories of there's some people who are, who are, you know, caught by surprise and they just grabbed what they could and ran. Other people who anticipated because maybe they were not in the central, you know, they weren't in Kiev immediately. They were on the outskirts uh, and they were able to prepare a little bit more. So, you know, that determines what you bring with you. OK, Paul, let's let's go to a critical question here. And several Chautauquans I talked to last evening in preparation for this said, make certain you find out particularly with the food, how can, can a well-intentioned Chautauquan help? Yeah, so what, what we're gonna be, hopefully when this thing, when this video comes out, we'll also have a link to, to our, uh, to a t couple of different groups. So one will be the nonprofit that's, that we're going to be working with to try to provide long-term housing. Okay. And so uh, we're, we're finalizing that right now. So hopefully that will be announced when this video comes out. Uh, additionally, you can always give to WCK.org, which is the World Central Kitchen. They let are go, helping people. Let, let me get that down. WCK.org. Dot org. Yep. Dot org. So World Central Kitchen, WCK.org. So that's uh, that's a place you can always give money and the money is going to go to food. I can tell you that just from experience, you know, it seems like their administrative costs, you know, uh, are, are, you know, minimized as much as possible. Uh, and so it's not something that's eating up all administrative. It's, it's probably, you know, a few percent is going to administrative costs and, and the rest is just going to food. And, and understand W world central kitchen is getting food into Ukraine. So it's not just on the border crossings. They're getting food into Lviv and, uh, and really trying to, uh, really trying to feed people. Right. Right. And, and so that would be a, that would be a, uh, charity where you would recommend it high payoff and not a, not sucked into fancy salaries for top administrators, but indeed. Yes. High delivery. And, and like I, absolutely. And, and like I said, uh, you know, we're going to have an announcement here, hopefully in the next couple of days about how you can give. So one, I'll, I'll put it this way. It's, it's how it's my analogy. And I think it works well. When you have your first child, all of your friends get together, oftentimes throw a baby shower, and you end up getting a lot of items for a newborn, clothes, diapers, all of that stuff. And then six months down the road, you have nothing because everyone was so focused on the newborn that they've grown out of it and time has elapsed. And now all of a sudden you've got nothing. What we have been focusing on is what do we do when we get to that nothing phase, right? Everybody is focused right now on refugees coming across. They're trying very hard to give. They want to give. The big NGOs have not yet really gotten engaged as much as I, I'm sure they're engaged in a significant way, but we're not necessarily seeing it because it takes them a little bit longer to assess and determine what they need to do. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we're trying to do, my, my friends and I, 
uh, and we've already got commitments of over twenty five thousand um, dollars is is literally find long term housing. We are like I said, we're working, we're finalizing an arrangement, hopefully with Habitat Poland. And we've got a nonprofit in the U.S. that we're also finalizing so that you'll be able to give to this nonprofit. They'll be able to transfer the fund legally to Habitat Poland to provide apartments for refugee families. Habitat Poland. Is, yeah. We're still working on the arrangement for that. But we're still working on it. There will be a U.S. based nonprofit that you'll be able to donate to specifically for our purpose uh, that will help us. That's, that's offered to help us. And we're just, like I said, we're just finalizing that. I mean, to come in and in three weeks, be able to identify a problem, identify partners on each side and to execute, I think is, is been pretty good, especially if you understand how difficult sometimes it is on the, on the Polish side in particular to, to execute some of these things. So I think we're actually in a really good place and I'm, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that we'll have this nailed down in the next couple of days. Yeah, we'll keep talking and I'll make certain there's a banner on the end once you feel confident as to where we would recommend. But as it stands now, wck.org works for the food. Tell me a little bit more, let's get back to the housing. Tell me a little bit more about what you're planning. This is, the, I understand this is kind of visionary, so things may change. So what are we planning for the housing? Well, I mean I mean, ultimately, I mean, the assumption here, so understand that many, many of the refugees want to stay in Eastern Poland, because like most Americans, they, they, most Americans don't go far away from their homes. They live in their general, they stay in their general area most of their lives. And that's how the Ukrainians are. And so they, they're hoping this war will end and they'll be able to go back soon. Uh, I'm not, and so ultimately, understanding that understanding that there is a massive number of people that have come across. I mean, Warsaw and Krakow are essentially full. You cannot find accommodations easily there. And so ultimately, we see that long-term accommodations are really going to be an issue. And understand, most of these people, many of them don't have money, right? I mean, they just left everything. And so they are just trying very hard to do whatever they can. And so listen, people are helping them with food. People are gonna help them, their kids get into schools. Hopefully there are a number of Ukrainian teachers who've come across who can help. I've actually heard that they're actually teaching some Ukrainians remotely from Ukraine. So they are staying with their schools, many of them in Western Ukraine. So, which is, they may be in Berlin, or they may be in school virtually. So that's a, that's a positive. And so for us, we're just simply focused on housing, long-term housing, six months or more. Let these people get settled, get some semblance of life moving, and then that will hopefully help them assimilate, get jobs, do the other things they need to do uh, to have good, happy, uh, successful time here in Poland. How similar is the Polish language to ukrainian mm, you know I, I i almost think i'm not an expert in the languages i almost feel like you know you go russian ukrainian polish there are some small similarities but i'd think I, I, ukrainian and russian i suspect are, are much closer than ukrainian and polish so there will be a learning curve but you know ultimately you've got a lot of children uh, and the children will pick up the languages just fine and they'll be able to ultimately help. And, and ultimately, there, there are also a lot of other Polish people who speak Russian. So especially the older Poles, because they all learned Russian during Soviet times. So there are ways of communicating. It may be Russian, but there are ways of communicating. So they will overcome that. Um, among, among the, uh, I think we, we may have answered this, among the uh, refugees you've talked to, is there any burning desire to relocate to a, a Western country, Germany or France or Britain? You know, I, I, I would say the majority really just are comfortable moving to Poland. And that's why you're seeing such large numbers in Poland. Uh, where you have difficulty uh, is, so for example, I have a friend from Marin County, California. His wife is Ukrainian. She's now a U.S. citizen. They've been married for many years and have children. And uh, her mother, sister, and nephew got out on day three. And I met I, when I flew here. They happened to be here as well. They came in the next day. So I've been with. I was with their family at the border, and they went to the U.S. embassy to get a visa. And this is remember, this is the first week. I don't know what the situation is today. Right. And they were denied. 
and they were denied. I mean, this is U.S. citizens. You know, these are not going to be people who are going to be a burden on the United States right. government in any way, right? Because ultimately, these people are going to live with their relatives in the U.S., and their relatives are going to take care of them. Uh, so those are the kinds of folks who I think do want to go. It's people who have relatives in, in Germany or France. Those are sort of the automatics. And it's much easier in Germany and France for them to relocate. It's much harder if they're trying to go to the U.S. So I've heard that the U.S. is, is setting up you know, for U.S. citizens. There's a program out being managed by the Frankfurt Embassy. Or I don't know if it's embassy, but a Frankfurt consulate, I guess. Uh, and so I, I'm not sure, you know, my friend Bobby knows more about that than, than I do. But I think that's going to be, that's those are the people who really want to go west, I think, are the people who have relatives in the west. And, and with relatives to take them in, to take care of them, yes. they're clearly not going to be, not going to be out the door when they get here. It looks like the family would set them up and help them get employment, move along. In life. Exactly. I mean, it's just a matter of what does the U.S. do to facilitate that? And we tend to be very slow bureaucratically on, on some of those items. Right, right. Um, how about, you, you've mentioned a couple of cities that seem to be filled. How about some of the, and I don't know how densely populated, it's not it's like Gdansk is up on the northern part of Poland. Are people moving forward past, past those major cities, like you said, Warsaw, Krakow? Uh, it's my understanding that they are. Uh, uh -huh. but is he, you know, for many, they want to go to Warsaw and Krakow simply because those are, are pathways to the West or to other opportunities because they're the two big cities, you know, Białystok, which is North of us here and is kind of across, it's near the border with Belarus. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I think even that is, is, has got a fair number of, of folks. So, I mean, when you're absorbing, I think right now they've got to be pretty close to have, having 2 million refugees now in the last three weeks uh just in poland forget about romania and, and slovakia and elsewhere just in poland it's got to be about two million maybe a touch more now and so that's that's a lot of people to absorb right but there are i mean but ultimately there, there will be you know help i'm sure from from other governments and ngos trying to you know facilitate uh housing and construction and, and things like that so maybe you know unfortunately it's women and children so they're not going to necessarily be able to do some of the construction jobs that might be available, but certainly the polls will be able to. Got it. Got it. Okay. Paul, I think we have given a good coverage of the issues here. And what I will make certain is you and I stay in contact. And when you have a good contact information for the housing assistance, we'll put this up on the web on Chautauqua people, put it on the grapevine. And I can only thank you sincerely if they possibly know how for taking care of those very needy folks listen you know what it's it's a you know in life you have opportunities to help sometimes you they they present themselves right in front of you and you got to take them i'm fortunate enough that i was able to have such support from my family to be able to do this and i say there's nothing like the reward of handing a stuffed animal to a child and having them give you a giant hug and their mother's crying in the background i mean it is it's a very emotionally trying moment but it's you know hopefully that's the beginning of the turning of the page for uh for that family and that's what you can keep your fingers crossed that that's that that's the case and and you are a parent yourself so easy to relate to children yeah so thank you thank you john okay thank you very much this has been this has been wonderful Thank you.